Hey, howdy, all, everyone. Lost Leader here, back in action for more Force of Will Attraction. As you can see, we have ourselves the construction deck, the Lost Tomes. And no, these aren't my tomes, they're Gil's tomes. As you can see by the little J roller right here. Um, aside from that, it's a pretty nifty deck, and honestly, if your deck can't beat this deck, that's a bad sign because this is a starter deck. And honestly, probably one of the best constructed starter decks I ever did face or see. It's kind of weird. But let's get into the actual effects and whatnot of what they do, as you'll see right here. Now right here, Gil Hamamatep, uh, he who controls the taboo. Why he has such a long name, I don't know. He's actually a historical character, which is kind of weird. And he's a wizard, which is kind of cool. Um, he's a ruler of light and dark, which actually will help for certain things and whatnot. So I actually have a, a quite frankly good idea of what you could do with this little guy when it comes to adding new things in and whatnot. But for now, I just want to focus on the things that he does as of right now. And that is his judgment being effectively a five cost. Now I've, I've dealt with five cost judgmenters before, and I will say you kind of aren't going to play him. They just you kind of just are not going to play him. I wish that were the case, but they just kind of don't get to be played uh, because of that stuff. And just, mm, like, you could probably, like, bring him in just to, like, nuke the field, essentially, but it just kind of sucks that he is the way he is. He does think, like, a little energizer of either having a light or dark, which is, like, really nifty. It could definitely help in tons of situations where you just don't have exactly the thing to pay for things, but... Considering everything, uh, he still has this little, um, interesting little effect where you pay any attribute cost for a historical figure. Any attribute cost. So that effectively makes it so any card that you have in your magic deck could pay for it. Uh, for any historical thing. Uh, except for Judgment, of course, which Judgment has its own little, like, extra thing to it. But that's completely fine. And even then, I think it's completely fine to have him actually use the historical thing, because he's historical as well. Yeah, historical cards with will with of any any attribute. It should be fine. I mean, if it isn't, then he still has some things that it could that could make him go and whatnot. But it's like whatever. And then whenever you put a historical card out, put a fate counter on target non-magic stone entity you control. Now this is something that I actually really really like because it's a very subtle hint of what happens uh, when you flip him over. And I really like that he kind of works on that judgment thing. So really, you're just going to use Judgment to kind of like close out the deal that you're going to win, in all honesty, or you're going to save your butt at the very last minute. Which, I've seen it done numerous times with this deck, and it's just really, really cool uh, what his side, what his little, little extra thing does, because it really, really helps, as we'll see right here. Here we go, it's this boy, Gilm a Metal Tap, uh, Treacherous, uh, or Treasury? Treasury? What was it? Yeah, Treacherous Emperor. That's what it is. Um, pretty cool. He actually has flying naturally, and he is a thousand twelve. So he is not that bad when it comes to like actually um coming out into play and being able to do a lot of damage and whatnot. And he actually has a really, really, really good um little movement thing here where he actually could gain himself imperishable, precision, or swiftness as long as he pays one little will and banishes a resonator. That is really, really, really cool. I love that to death, that he could do that. Gives him a lot of utility for late game, in the sense that he could come out with swiftness and just be able to swing. And that is such a good thing. Precision is just kind of like a nifty little secondary thing, but Imperishable is also very important, as we have Shayla's running around as a, as a natural counter to a lot of J-Rollers out there, but for the most part, I don't think you're really going to use Imperishable as much as you're going to use Swiftness. And with that being said, that actually plays into a lot of other cards that are gonna, you're going to be seeing um, pretty dang soon, as we're going to be like looking through the whole entire deck here. But I want to get to Gil because he actually is the reason that this de whole entire deck is makes itself. As, as you can see here, he also has a little Magic Stone you, can, you control gain. Uh, they can produce pretty much any will that they want. Which is really, really freaking cool, but uh, he plays historical cards to begin with, and this whole entire deck is vastly historical cards, so it never really matters when it comes to that point. In fact, if we look back, 
you can pretty much play any historical card with any will attribute, so it's just doesn't really matter with this deck at all. It matters when you start remaking this deck and whatnot. And in all honesty, if you were to remake this deck, which I will be suggesting to remake this deck, there's only a slight, slight amount that I would suggest that you actually change within this deck, and that is it. Aside from that, you're completely fine from running it pretty much straight from the get-go. You could just buy the star, star deck and you could go into any competitive scene. Like, literally any competitive scene, I feel like you've placed well enough. Like, I don't think this, this starter deck could win any major tournament out there, but let's say that there's like a like a forcible tournament out there that you want to actually like go out to. Like, th these, this whole entire deck I feel is that competitive, where it could just, it is able to do enough to like disrupt a lot of decks out there. And any like top tier decks out there will at least have trouble with this deck like you won't get completely slaughtered when you play this deck especially if you're like a really good player too so I think having a, a starter deck like this is just really really freaking cool and um, a biggest reason why it actually is as good as it is is because of this J rulers God art twist of fate it is a zero cost and of course it being a god art you can only use it once per game but that little thing that it does, destroy all other non-magic stone entities with no fate counters on them. Then remove the rest from the game. So that pretty much means that he could kill J rulers out there too as well. He could do that too. He could do exactly what Shayla does, um, but to an even greater effect. Shayla just comes on the board faster than this guy does. That's, that's the only thing that really happens that changes anything. But it's really, really cool that he does get to do that, and he just blows up the whole board. Um, ruins a lot of J rollers out there, rules, uh, and he also is able to keep some of his peeps out there too, as long as they have fake counters and whatnot. So it's just really, really freaking cool that he does do that. All right, the first one we have here is Venus Magus of the Metal Star. Actually, a really good card for what it does. It's a two-two. Light Resonator doesn't really matter all that much because she's a historical um, Resonator so that means you can be paid with any will will only matter if you're not running a uh, gill essentially which when you're just running this deck solo Meh, whatever But when this card enters the field choose one reveal any number of historical cards from your hand put X uh, Plus 100 plus 100 counters on this card where X is the number of cards revealed in this way or you just get to draw a card. Either way, really good effect. Honestly, I feel if you're running a solo light deck, you could just run this card just for the draw effect. Because you just get to choose one of these things. Either reveal the historical cards or you just get to draw a card. Really good stuff. You have a trump blocker. She works really well. She is insanely great for this deck because a lot of your cards are going to be historical cards. So there's really no reason not to run her. On top of the fact that she actually gets that plus 100, plus 100 counter for essentially revealing your hand. Um, if you reveal your whole entire hand beginning of the game, you go second. She has the potential to be a 8-8 first turn. That is kind of insane when you think about it. So just having that potential um, there, honestly, probably the biggest reason why you would play this, uh, play this deck the way that it is. Just to have that. Sure, you're revealing your whole entire hand to your opponent, but there's a lot of things that just make it so it doesn't really matter. And what I mean by that is thought control. Thought control, they're likely going to have if it's a very competitive deck, so they're going to see your hand anyway. And at that point, it doesn't really matter. So having them see your whole entire hand, completely fine, honestly, at this given point. Um, it's going to be played way too often, so there's really no downside to actually doing this. And it's just really great to have her out there. And then you can just either draw a card or just do whatever. Pretty fun. Love this card. Chrono Researcher Al Alcerius. Why do they all have really weird, really weird names? But this is the first Resonator within this deck that I actually would consider not running. And that's because of his cost. He is a three coster, so it really takes a lot out of his potential value that he has for himself. I understand why they did that because giving your J Roller Swiftness is already a big gain as a whole, but he also does his little entry effect when he enters the field, he gets to remove the top card of your deck, 
And then when you do, you could also play that card. You could play the given card that was removed from, from this, uh, re removed by that card. So you do get a nice little sort of pseudo draw when it comes to that. But for the most part, I really feel like it's not really worth it when it comes to uh, this three costing card. If anything, I would suggest reducing this card down because of how big it is and either just getting more counters to this deck or something better, just something a little bit better. Like, I don't think he's like a full potential loss, but in comparison to the four amount that you do get, I was just putting him down by two. Cause him being a three cost really does not help himself at all. And it just doesn't really work as well as you would want it to. Just the card that seems like one of like a greater card than he actually is. Essentially. Now here we go, it's Sylvia the Slave Girl. Now this is a neato card. I love this card. And it is the exact reason why I actually bought this deck is because of the potential that she has. Dragonoid Historical, so that means she can be paid with whatever it is. And she has a little awakening cost too, that essentially makes her an 8 cost instead of a 1 cost. But you can play her as a 1 cost and she has a little extra things, but we'll, we'll get to the awakening bit, which is the most exciting part here. Uh, deals 2,000 damage to each J Resonator your opponent controls, then put 16 plus 100 plus 100 counters on this card. That is insanity. That is insanity right there. Effectively, if you awaken her, it's game. Effectively. You nuke their board of everything there. Unless they have like something like um like Ayu that's able to pump it up completely, they're just not gonna be able to live. Like there's not a lot of J uh, there's not a lot of J resonators out there that go past 2,000 health. There just isn't. And it's the saddest thing out there because they it's not targeting anybody, it's not doing anything to anybody except for damage. So it just goes full out explosions. Pretty freaking ridiculous, um, just with that awakening alone. I really tried to make a deck with this card involved for its awakening, but unfortunately I just wasn't able to. So she is most likely um, for later on usage more than anything else. But she does have a nifty little gimmick here that does not involve her awakening. Which if she just had her awakening, she'd be a good card. But what bumps her up to being a great card, and a card worth buying this deck literally over, is this. This card gains flying, swiftness, precision, and pierce as long as uh, there is a plus 100 plus 100 counter on it. There are a number of cards in Force of Will that give plus 100 plus 100 counters on your resonators. It is not hard to do and there's a lot of potential to actually let you do that. And that is probably the coolest thing out there and something that I like a whole whole bunch. And I really want to play around with this card more. In fact, I made another deck revolving around giving your counters along with its extra little side thing going on with it because having a 4-4 have flying and swiftness is already like an annoying bit. Like it's not super bad to have like this 500-500 come at you uh, with flying and swiftness. But it also has pierce and precision, so it can attack whatever it wants, it can do whatever it wants. It's essentially a card that your opponent wants to get rid of as soon as possible. And that's just pretty freaking cool. That it's just, it's a big nuisance to your opponent. And they really want to get rid of it. And then in the late game potential, you have this little thing going for it. Where it just enters the field and it nukes everything. So it's nice that it has such good early game potential and late game potential. But unfortunately you do have to work with a card for it to have any early game potential. Because in this deck, this is something that you save to just end the game. Um, that's that's a cool thing with Gil is that he just has these little things to have end game goals to it. But that's kind of it. Um, very easy to cancel the card regardless. Um, of course you have to like worry about that. But it's just a nifty card. And it gives you a lot of options, a lot of value to what it does, but it could be used in better decks. This is definitely one of those cards that's not being used for its full potential in this deck, but it's still a good card, and it still makes this deck work overall. Sa uh, Saturnus Enchanter of the Earth Star. 
Why are they all with these weird pretentious names? I don't understand. It's a two cost, but it's a really good two cost. Like, he doesn't look good at first. Like, I looked at him the first time through, and I'm like, nah, this guy is just not good. But having that attack 500 and defense 700 um, as a two cost means that he can just stick around a little bit longer than he needs to. On top of the fact that he just has this nice little effect that he enters. Put target non-magic stone, non-J resonator entity. Your opponent controls on the bottom of their deck. So you just get some addition hate right there. And it's possibly even better addition hate. Because they can't use the graveyard to do anything about it. So they're just like, I can't get this card back. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much the point. You don't get your card back and I get to not have to deal with it for like a long time. Until you shuffle your deck. And then of course he has this little extra utility thing to him too. With that zero cost target J resonator you control gains zero plus 200 until end of turn. He can play it only once per turn. Um, but... The fact that he can play it every given turn is pretty freaking cool. So you give yourself a little extra leeway to like actually attack and be okay for the most part. Or if like your opponent's trying to damage it, you give it plus 200. Uh, or you can even possibly survive um, the little explosion that Sylvia does by giving Sylvia the plus 200 if you're facing the same deck and whatnot. Just really cool card for what it does. Excellent value for what it does and everything. Just something that you should always keep in your deck if you're just making this your deck and you just want to modify it just ever so much because this deck does not need a lot of modifications it just needs some scan vision it is uh, one cost quick cast blue and at first I was like this card isn't good this card just doesn't look good at all but you have to remember what what's, what's happening with a lot of the historical cards here is that they give fake counters they give all these little um things to go with it and looking at the top five cards of your deck um and then you just get to reveal two historical figures um resonators and whatnot and you get to put it into your hand that's good that's some good stuff right there i get to have um more draw potential get get rid of the cards that i don't want to get at the same time and i just may need to sack the resonators or i just need to build up what i need to build up in order to like destroy them on their side and whatnot regardless it's just a nifty little card to help speed things up in case you don't get resonators first turn or let's say that you get this card first turn you can put any resonators that you don't want on the bottom of your deck and just get the cards that you need to get and then just play this card so you get more cards just really cool just interesting little, little thing uh, of course if this was in any other deck except for historical would not work literally only works for this deck it's kind of funny in that regard but it being a historical character, um, well, not a character, um, card, just really works for this deck and this deck alone. <laughs> so yeah, of course you're gonna keep this card. Really good for um, drawing. Really, really good for getting resonators and whatnot. Just there's no reason to play any other blue draw card. There just isn't. Not when it's a historical card. And here we have it. The first one that actually is very just on the nose. Not good for this deck. I know that's really weird, but there's pretty much only like two cards that are really just not good for this deck, and a few other cards that would work better in other decks. It's really, really weird in that sense that this deck has that, but for the most part, this deck is completely viable. But Jupiter Warlock of the Wood Star just doesn't work for this deck. This deck has no mana ramp, it has no way of getting that, that five costing resonator out at any given time. And despite him being a nice little cancel card, only cancels a target chant or just returns the target resonator to an opponent's hand or they get to rest or recover a target resonator. Or they get to draw a card. It's nifty that he gets to pick two of these things, but the fact that he's a five cost does not help him be played. It just doesn't. Him being played at a five cost just essentially means that you're not using Amul at the time, you're not you're not bringing Amul out and going like, hey, you know, I'm going to blow up the whole entire field. You're not going to be doing that um, when you use him. And as much as it's cool to have a little cancel for himself and whatnot, he just doesn't work in this deck. If it was any other deck like a cancel deck or like a mana ramping deck, he'd be very good with that deck. Just not this deck. Like, literally, this is the only deck he should not be in. And that's only because of how expensive he is to play. That is the only reason why he's not good to play in this deck. 
He's a good card, but he's not a good card for this deck. He doesn't have a fit role for this deck because of how much he costs. And that's just the sad truth because I know he's supposed to be the hard hitter of the deck. He's supposed to have that attack 1,000, defense 12,000. That's really, really cool that he has that. just doesn't work. It's the sad truth. And if we're going to make any cut to this deck, this is your guy. This is the guy that automatically gets cut for sure off the team. You're better off with just like a, a less cost and cancel card. You really are. Which is a shame because he actually looks pretty cool. I like how he has a little wood staff and he has an owl so of sorts. But, sorry Owlboy. You gotta go. Now here's an interesting one. Viola Treacherous Maiden. Really weird that she could target herself with this plus 200, plus 200 and flying. And she could gain dragon till end of turn. So it could be a dragon, dragonoid, uh, historical uh, resonator. And her being a 6-6 six, six isn't too bad either, but it's just, she's not as great as she could be. And that's the sad truth in it. I'm not saying she shouldn't be run in this deck if you're planning to like run a deck of these cards and whatnot. She just is a bit underwhelming in comparison to the last few cards that we actually saw. I'm not saying she don't have utility, I'm not saying she don't have anything that's like worth her, her grip with it. Just kind of a lot of awkwardness to this deck because it doesn't tempo well with the other cards in this deck. It really is just kind of weird <laughs> what was happening here. If she did something like target J Resonator gains uh, plus 200, plus 200 uh, counters, that would work tremendously. I would love for her to have that because that means that your, um, your, your Sylvia actually comes more into play in that fact like literally just having her give counters for a turn and flying would have really helped this card be far greater into this thing but it may have also made this deck incredibly busted regardless um still a good card could be used for a lot of interesting little little side notes and whatnot but she just kind of is just a good card in a relatively good deck she doesn't really have synergy aside from the fact that she's historical and also it's kind of weird how she has this little banish this card, remove up to two target cards in a, in a single graveyard from the game. Just not quite understandable, honestly. It really isn't because banishing the card is a cost. Um, so you, there's no way that you could like have this card just like kind of go into battle and just like do something like really cool or anything like that and then just banish the card after the fact. Uh, it's not like like your pig where you could go into attack and it gets blacked or banish him instead. Um, you just kind of just remove two cards from any given graveyard. Okay, that's kind of cool, but why do I have to banish the card? Can I just tap myself or something? It's a, a stupid ability that could have some use in a very niche moments, but I don't get it. I really don't get it. It's It's whatever. <laughs> Blazer, the legendary thief. Oh, look at that. We have our first cancel black card out there. Actually, pretty freaking amazing card here for sure. Um, four constant card. Has precision, which is really nifty. And I'm liking that they're giving more and more cards precision. Because I feel like that's something that needs to like come into more play. And force a will. But all his other stuff is where he gets busted. And just makes him like really good. And the funny thing is, too, is that he's only good as himself. Like, not as anything else. He doesn't get to cancel a whole bunch of things, but what he does cancel is pretty freaking cool. As we see here, when he enters the field, he gets to look at the opponent's hand, choose a card, they discard the card, and then you put a plus 100 plus 100 counter on this card. That is so good! It is a four-costing card for your opponent to discard a card. On top of you powering up this resonator, to a 9-9 instead of the 8-8 that it already is. So it being an 8-8, not really that big of a deal. It's like, okay, I understand why it's an 8-8 instead of the way that it is. It being a historical figure, you can just play it this whatever you want. That's pretty freaking cool. And you just got that good value to it too. But what really gets them busted is the remove of plus 100, plus 100 counter from this card. Choose one, remove an attacking J Resonator battling with this card from um, uh, from battle or cancel target spell or ability targeting uh, this card. Really, really cool little thing because that means that he can just go into battle 
swinging freely. Like, if someone decides to block him, like, hey, no, you don't get to block me. Remove the counter. Still deal, still deal 800 damage to you. Um, or just something like trying to kill him, like bring him back up. Like, no, I'm going to cancel that ability, so I'm going to remove that 100 hunter counter. Uh, just really cool that he gets to do that little extra thing, and Black actually has a cancel for once. I mean, it's only on one card that he gets to cancel a spell or ability that targets it, but it's still a cancel. We need more cancels for the other freaking uh, attributes for so well, please stop giving it to just wind. Other cards need them, like this. Oh, it's just really sad that it took this long to get a proper cancel for um, Black, even though it's not even like that big of a deal, because it's literally just this card that doesn't get to get canceled, it doesn't get to have anything done to it and whatnot. Which is really sad, but <laughs> that's the case in point. Regardless, he has a really good amount of just like being able to hit an opponent for for eight uh, damage just off the bat, and then if you're able to get more counters on him, which honestly is kind of a viable thing to actually add to this deck instead of various other things, um, like the Jupiter guy, then he could have even more value than what he's worth, which is just pretty freaking cool. But yeah, really great card for this deck good card in any black deck honestly because if he just comes in swinging with a black deck there's there's ways to give him 100 100 counters there just is so yeah great stuff and here we have rachel a nymphal contract maker interesting card for what it can do she's a three coster she's seven attack eight defense which is already kind of like eh. I don't know if I should play or not, you could have more value, I don't know. But then she has this little tap ability and then remove a resonator you control from the game. Uh, rem we'll remove another one, not not her specifically. Put target resonator from your graveyard into the field. Play this ability only during your turn. Now that's pretty cool. That means that you could actually bring that resonator out. Um, just kind of like at the end of uh, you you getting it killed or something like that. Let's say that you have a, a blazer that came out. You did the plus 100, plus 100 counter. They were able to like stop it somehow or something like that. You had to get rid of a little spell or ability. Then blazer dies because it doesn't have that 100, 100 counter anymore. And the resonator is too strong. So he dies. You're like, oh no, what the heck do I do? You can actually have Rachel bring him back. Which is pretty freaking cool when you think about it. So that means that all your resonators that you don't want to like die like right away, but you kind of need to swing in for that attack, you kind of just go ahead and do that with this. Which is just really cool that you have that extra ability to like use the graveyard. The only problem of course being is that she's a 3 cost and uh, I don't really know about that whole entire 3 cost and bit thing there. But for this deck she works just as good because she's a historical figure and whatnot. And I'm sure in other decks that use the graveyard a lot, like the Null decks, wink wink nudge nudge, uh, could really really use her uh, for that effect too. So she has plenty of stuff that she can do, especially in dark. It just kind of sucks that she's a three coster one. That means that you have to like kind of work up to her in order for her to have uh, the great value that she wants to have. But aside from that, she could do a lot of sneaky things in this game that just kind of really work well for her and for the rest of her entire team. Of course, you always need to like sack a nobody, so that's kind of sucks, but still, a lot of combo potential with her. And here we have the Forbidden Arts. It's a very good uh, chant. A historical chant, too. Destroy Target Resonator. That's just a two cost Destroy Target Resonator. That is that is fantastic. Even playing just a black and a, and a light um, is really good for this card, just destroying Target Resonator. I always like it when they're just straight up, just this, just destroy them because it's just so simple it's so easy and you just get to do it whenever and the cool thing about this thing is is that you could destroy a resonator when you're attacking and they're like all trying to block and everything like that you're like chump boom hit them there give yourself the free 800 the free 900 the free 1000 i don't know what you're swinging with but whatever you're swinging with you could do it harder now and that's just the coolest bit to it what makes this card especially great because it's a quick cast and that means anytime anywhere you could be there <laughs> just a very simple card and simply that good
Then, of course, we have to review the little magic stones that we got going on here. There are only two magic stones available. Uh, a Metal Tips, a uh, little Ultra Magic Stone, which we have not actually seen one of these for quite some time, but we finally have a true Magic Stone. Of course, these true Magic Stones could only be in um, one given, uh, what is it called? The thing, you know, the, the Magic Stone deck. There could only be one, essentially, or rather, there could only be one revealed, because you can have four copies of this card, it just cannot be there the same turn. <laughs> It just is not allowed. That's the whole entire reason why it's called a true magic stone. But aside from that, very niche card for what it does, because it's only really used for historical resonators. Which is weird on one hand, but on another hand, that means you get to power them up. Which is pretty freaking cool. On top of that, it just produces a mana whatever, so having a historical uh, chant be able to just do things with that, it's completely fine. But what's really odd about this card is that it also has a little additional costing card to it, which is two cost, and then you tap it. And then when you tap that card, you roll the top uh, card of your deck. If it's a historical, um, if it's historical, you put it into your hand. So that's pretty much just a free draw in case like you really don't have anything to go with things. But why wasn't it a one cost instead? I figure if it being a one cost would kind of help speed things up a bit. And on top of that, it's not like you can spam that little thing a whole bunch anyway. So for a lot of reasons, you're only going to really be using this card to either produce mana to just like make a historical uh, card come out, or you're going to just target a historical resonator, which it shouldn't be too hard in all honesty when you think about it, because you could just like leave this card open for next turn and just power up your, your historical resonator just kind of like freely, give them extra 200, 200, give that blazer 200, 200, so he's at a thousand, um... Oh no, you beat out 11 with his 100-100 his counter and you're just like completely fine. You're like, yeah, let's do this. Got that going on. But aside from that, it's just a sort of whatever card. It, you would think that this being one of the first true magic stones out there, it'd do a little bit more than this, but kind of underwhelming for it. Not Well, aside from the fact that it just works good with historical cards. That's pretty much it. But this is the card that gets me the most right here. This is definitely an odd card to me. Um, mainly because it's like produce to spend this uh, will only to play historical cards. Which is fine I guess, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. In the sense that like, like Koman already does that. He already does all that little stuff and whatnot. I mean I guess they're trying to like use this card here so it's like, hey if you get four of these cards. That means that you could um, use historical cards for other J rollers and whatnot, which I guess makes sense in that regard. But it's still really weird considering everything. But that produced light and dark, and then you can spend it for only a, to do judgment is pretty cool too. But it's still a kind of eh. I I don't know what you're really trying to accomplish here with that historical magic stone uh, card here. I, I I'm literally guessing that it's just to make light and dark uh, J rulers be more fitted to run historical uh, characters and whatnot, historical resonators, which is kind of cool. Now that I think about it, you could probably run a, a Amal deck with this, literally just to like, kind of like go with things and whatnot, but it's still sort of like, but why would you really want to, you know? I mean, Amon kind of compliments historical, uh, historical <laughs> resonators as is, so it's just kind of like, I guess, oh. And there we have it, the Lost Tombs. A really good deal, really good value, and a lot of great cards. If you're even mildly interested in Force of Will, I strongly suggest that you pick this up. It's a really good value and it will really help you get into the game. And even if you're part of the game, there's still plenty of cards here that have plenty of value to actually pick up and decide to like put it in your deck. Honestly, it's a win-win on both fronts. And probably the best starter deck I've ever seen in any kind of trading card game. Aside from that, thank you all for watching and I hope you all have a good time. If you like this video, please share it if you can, and I shall see you all later, okay? Sayonara! Bye bye!